Hi, everyone. Welcome to Connecting to Cloud SQL from Kubernetes. My name is Curtis Van Ginn. I'm a developer programs engineer, and I work on Google Cloud Platform to make the developer experience better for developers like you. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, how to connect to Cloud SQL from Kubernetes, and we're going to have three main points. The first is we're going to cover how to connect to Cloud SQL in general. Then we're going to narrow down and talk about connecting from Kubernetes to Cloud SQL. And then finally, we're going to narrow down even more and do a hands-on example of uh, the best practices for connecting to Kubernetes. Before we begin, there's some basics that you should understand before we start. Uh, first, it's expected that you know and understand Cloud SQL and how a managed database works, what some of the benefits are, and when you should try and use one. Second, it's uh, understood that you should understand the basics of a container, the, how container images work, and what some of the benefits for containerization are. And finally, we hope that you understand some of the basics, at least, of Kubernetes, and you understand some concepts such as pod and deployments. First, let's talk about connecting to Cloud SQL. When you're connecting, there's two different things you need to think about. First, the path, how am I going to reach the instance? And the second is authorization. How do I get permission to talk to the instance? When you're selecting a path, you have two different options. The first option is public IP. Public IP is a static IPv4 address that's accessible from the public internet. As long as you have access to the internet, you can potentially connect to your Cloud SQL instance. By default, authorization is required since we don't want anyone connecting to your application that has access to the internet. Some of the benefits of public IP is that you can connect from outside GCP. Well, one of the drawbacks is you may have higher latency since you're connecting over the internet instead of using an internal network. The second option you have is to connect using private IP. Private IP is an IPv4 address that's peered into your project via a virtual private cloud, or VPC for short. By default, authorization is not required, but you do have to be on the VPC to access your Cloud SQL instance. One of the benefits of private IP is you usually have lower latency. This is because you're not connecting over the internet and instead connecting directly through an internal network. Mm -hmm. Once you've decided how to connect, the next step is authorization. When it comes to authorization, there's three different options you have to look at. The first is the Cloud SQL proxy. The Cloud SQL proxy is a binary that provides IAM authentication. It uses a service account to provide authorization and strong encryption using short-lived SSL certificates. The second option you can use is authorized networks. This is where you specify a list of IP addresses that are authorized to connect. For private IP, there's a similar feature called VPC egress firewall rules that you can use instead. The third option is self-managed SSL. You can create SSL certificates for your instance that it can be distributed to your application that encrypt your connections. For MySQL and Postgres, this is a client and server-side credential, while for SQL Server, this is only a server-side credential. It's important to remember that these options are for authorization only. You still have to authenticate with the database using your username and password. So to summarize, you have private IP and you have public IP. For public IP, you have to use either the Cloud SQL proxy or authorized networks. We also recommend that if you are using authorized networks that you use self-managed SSL. This encrypts your data and makes sure that no one else can read it in transit unless they have the certificates. However, this is automatically done by the Cloud SQL proxy. So if you decide to use it, you won't have to worry about managing your own SSL. When it comes to public versus private, use whichever one works best. And for authorization, while we recommend the Cloud SQL proxy, it's perfectly OK to use authorized networks and self-managed SSL as well. Next, let's talk about Kubernetes to Cloud SQL. There are three different ways that you're going to see people recommending you to connect. The first is you can connect directly using private IP. The second is you can run the proxy as a service. And finally, you can run the proxy as a sidecar. This is our recommended solution over the first two. Because private IP doesn't require any authorization, it's possible to just connect directly. You can just put in the private IP uh, into your application and connect to that directly to your Cloud SQL instance. In order to access that private IP, you have to be on a VPC native Google Kubernetes engine cluster. Now, this means that it has to be a GKE cluster if you're using a cluster off that uh, off GCP, you won't be able to connect. Now, you may be thinking, if it's so easy to use private IP, do I still want to use the proxy? 
With a proxy, there's the downside of the initial setup being a little bit of a hassle, but the upside is you get strong IAM authentication and strong encryption for all the data from your application. For the proxy, the advantage is you don't have to worry about the setup. You can connect directly via IP, but it requires a VPC native cluster. So if you're connecting from off GKE, you don't have that option. And there's weak authorization. Anyone on your cluster could potentially connect to your database. Why is IAM so important? What, like, why do we push the proxy so hard? Well, the reason is, is that you can use a service account to represent your entire application. It gives you a one-to-one -one mapping of permissions to applications, which makes it easy to manage. If you decide that an application no longer has need to access a database, you can simply remove the permission and it no longer can, even if uh, the changes to the app are made. Finally, it follows the principle of least privilege. The app only has the minimum permissions that are needed, which is a great security advantage. When you're running the proxy as a service, typically you do it as a separate deployment from your application. So you can see on the left here, we have our application pods being deployed. And on the right, we have our proxy pods being deployed. Now your application is going to connect directly to the proxy, and then your proxy is going to route your connection right to Cloud SQL. One of the downsides to this is that the traffic between your application and the proxy is not encrypted by default. The proxy doesn't offer any encryption on the client side. It only encrypts the traffic coming out before it gets connected to Cloud SQL. Another disadvantage is no authorization. Anyone on your cluster can connect to the proxy, which means anyone on your cluster can connect to Cloud SQL. This negates the advantage I was talking about before with Cloud SQL IAM authentication. Another disadvantage is there's a single point of failure. If all of the applications are using a single deployment of the proxy to run, if that deployment fails, all of your applications are no longer able to connect. If something goes wrong in the proxy and it stops operating correctly, all of your applications fail instead of just one instance. Finally, another disadvantage is the application and the proxy aren't necessarily running in the same zone or region. This adds additional latency because now your application has to jump first to your proxy and then to the Cloud SQL instance, which could be in an entirely different region or zone as well. By keeping the application and the proxy together, you can eliminate this, meaning you only have to worry about the latency to the Cloud SQL instance. This is why we recommend running the proxy as a sidecar. It's called a sidecar pattern because if you think of a motorcycle with a sidecar, it's attached to the side. You still have your main application here in the middle, and then you have the Cloud SQL proxy attached to the side right here. The application can connect to the Cloud SQL proxy directly, which then connects to Cloud SQL. Because this is a pod, it's an atomic unit, meaning the application and the Cloud SQL proxy are always together. If the Cloud SQL proxy fails, the application has also failed. If the application fails, the Cloud SQL proxy is still running in the other pods. It's authorized. Because the Cloud SQL proxy is inside the same pod as the application, only the application can access it, and you don't have to worry about other traffic accessing the proxy that's not supposed to. It's also isolated. If the application fails or the proxy fails, you don't have to worry about the rest of your application going down. It's just that pod that fails. And finally, it's encrypted. The minute the data leaves your Cloud SQL proxy, it is encrypted and sent to your Cloud SQL instance before it's unencrypted. This means you don't have to worry about anybody potentially listening in between your application and your proxy. Okay, so you're, you're convinced. You want to use the Cloud SQL proxy in the sidecar. But how? Let's talk about deploying the proxy as a sidecar. Again, there's two different things you need to think about. The first is you need to decide how to pass credentials into the proxy. Once you've decided that, you just have to mount the proxy as a sidecar onto an existing application. When you're passing credentials, again, you have a couple of choices to make. The first is workload identity. This is where you can map a Google service account, or GSA for short, to a Kubernetes service account, or KSA for short. The advantage of this is you don't have to worry about managing any secrets, but it is a GKE only feature. This means you'll have to use a GKE cluster if you want to take advantage of this. If you're not using a GKE cluster, or if you're operating uh, somewhere that doesn't have workload identity, you can still use a service account key file. This is where you have service account credentials that are stored in a JSON key file. The downside is you have to worry about keeping track of that JSON key file and rotating it, but you are able to do this on a standard Kubernetes instance. So option one, workload identity for GKE. If you look to the left over there, you'll see the application and the Cloud SQL proxy. What happens when you decide you need application default credentials is the client library, including the Cloud SQL proxy, 
can reach out to the metadata server. This is true for both the application and the proxy, so you can use one service account to represent both things. Once the Cloud SQL proxy makes that call, it gets the token that it needs to authorize with the instance and uses it to make any API calls necessary. In order to set this up, the first thing you'll need to do is create a Kubernetes service account. This is a fairly simple deployable and can be a config.yaml that's stored along with your application's deployment. Step two is need to bind your Google service account to the Kubernetes service account. This is two steps. It's one G Cloud command that specifies which Google service account you're using and which Kubernetes service account. And then it's a second step in kubectl to connect your Kubernetes service account. Finally, once you've done the first two steps, you need to add the Kubernetes service account to your application. All you need to do is add the service account name that you specified in the first step and then bound in the second step to make sure that your application uses it when it's deployed next. GKE will automatically handle the metadata server for you as long as the option is enabled on your cluster. The second option you have is the service account key file. In this case, both the application and the proxy are going to load the credentials from a file and then use that credential to generate the tokens needed to make any API calls. Step one is you have to create a service account key. So once you have your Google service account created, you can use a quick gcloud command to create a local key.json file. Step two is you want to turn the key into a secret. Using kubectl, you can create a generic secret with whatever name you prefer, and you can use a specific file name and load it from that local file. In this case, we're using service account.json and we're loading it in from key.json, which we created in step one. Step three is we want to mount as a volume. What this is going to do is put inside your pods file system the file that you've created as a secret and make it accessible for your application to access. Once you've mounted it as a file, both the application and the proxy can read it in and use it when it's creating API calls. Now, after you've decided how you're going to mount the credentials, you just need to mount the proxy itself as a sidecar. In this case, the proxy runs in its own container and it shares a pod with the main application. This means it's really easy to take your existing configuration and add the Cloud SQL proxy to it. You can see above, we have a pretty standard uh, containers deployment here where you have a list of containers that you're using in your Cloud SQL proxy. On this top half here, we have things like the environment variables you're using to configure your database. See, this one is database user, which is created from a secret. You also have the name of the application in any other configuration, such as image or whatever you're deciding to use. On top of that, you can specify the name of the Cloud SQL proxy. So you add as a separate entry in your list here, image Cloud SQL Docker GCE proxy. This is an image that we maintain for you so that you can use it. Second, you just need to add the command that you want the Cloud SQL proxy to run. So here we just have Cloud SQL proxy. If you're using private IP, you want to enable the IP addresses types flag and set it equal to private. And if you're using a service account, you want to make sure that you add the credential file flag as well to tell it where exactly that service account is located. Finally, you'll use the instances flag to pass in the name of the instance and the TCP port you want it to listen to. You can use whatever TCP port you want, or you can just default to the standard for MySQL, Postgres, or SQL mm -hmm. Server. If you're interested in learning more, here's some additional resources you can take a look at. The first is the Cloud SQL Proxy, which is open source, written in Go, available on GitHub. The second is the Cloud SQL JDBC Socket Factory. This can be used by Java users to connect directly to your Cloud SQL instance without using the proxy in a similar manner. If you're interested in finding more, please take a look at the repos. And if you encounter any issues, please open an issue on GitHub and let us know. Thanks for watching and have a great day.